Howdy folks, in this video I'd like to discuss and answer a very important question. And that question is why are neutron stars called neutron stars? Or rather, why did roughly 90 years ago the scientists thinking about these compact objects give them the name neutron star? Well, the short answer to all that is the abundance of the neutrons in the matter that makes up a neutron star. But I want to discuss this a little bit further. We're going to do some quick, dirty, uh, back-of-the-envelope dense matter physics that I'm going to try to do in such a manner that uh, as wide of an audience will be able to watch it and understand it as possible. That said, uh, don't be scared if you don't have a lot of experience in physics, mathematics, that type of stuff. I'm going to try to keep it at an algebraic level. And for those of you that are at more of a higher level, um, I'm going to be taking quite a number of liberties in doing this. But the whole point of it is to try to best answer the question, why are neutron stars actually called neutron stars? And the best place to begin is actually with the matter that makes up a neutron star. So when we talk about matter, we're really talking just about atoms, and here's your periodic table of elements, and these are all just atoms, and well, what are atoms? Well, they're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, the proton being positively charged, the neutron being neutrally charged, and the electron being negatively charged. Hopefully this is all review at this point. We could go into more exotic particles or like quarks and things like that, but for the purposes of this video, that would just be overcomplicating. We don't need to do that. Not to mention that 90 years ago, um, I don't even know that there was much of a, a discussion with regard to quarks and whatnot. So we're just going to focus on protons, neutrons, and electrons. And these all come together to form an atom. Here's a simple orbital model of an atom where you can see electrons orbiting around the nucleus of the atom where there are our protons and neutrons. Again, hopefully this is all review for you. This isn't really the best way of portraying an atom or animating an atom. If you want to see that, you can go and check out some of the videos uh, on simulating or animating uh, hydrogen atoms to get a better idea of what an atom really looks like. But the orbital model has been around for quite a while, and it, it's going to serve our purposes perfectly fine for this video, so we're going to go ahead and just use that. Now, with protons and electrons being of opposite charge, they do not like being very close to one another. That's why you have, or rather that's partly why, you have electrons orbiting around the nucleus of the atom that contains the protons and the neutrons. These opposite charged particles don't like getting close to one another. And when they get close to one another, some interesting reactions can happen. One such reaction is called inverse beta decay. Some of you may know this as electron-induced or electron capture inverse beta decay. But basically, the proton and the electron uh, will react and leave us with a neutron and another particle called an electron neutrino. The electron neutrino is very important when it comes to studying neutron stars. That's why I include it in here. But for the purposes of this video, we're just kind of going to neglect it. But through this process, hopefully you can already begin to kind of see where more and more neutrons start to come from. But the bigger question we need to answer with this knowledge of inverse beta decay is where can we find these conditions that cause inverse beta decay? Now, I, I mean, where can these conditions actually occur naturally? Where can, where can these happen in nature? And the short answer to this question is supernovas, otherwise known as the deaths of main sequence stars. Here is supernova 1054, otherwise known as the Crab Nebula, home to the Crab Pulsar, or one might also call it the Crab Neutron Star. You can see it's big, bright, beautiful uh, gas nebula that's very well known and very well studied. And here we have a supernova 1604, otherwise known as Kepler's supernova. Again, a bright, beautiful ball of gas that you can see right here. And so what do I actually mean by a supernova well, or the death of a main sequence star? Well, uh, basically... A star is constantly going through the process of nuclear fusion in that it's taking smaller atoms and making more and more massive atoms. And so eventually, that few, when there's not enough material to go through that fusion process anymore, 
that thermonuclear pressure is going to start to weaken. And as a result of what happens there is gravity takes over, and then you have a supernova. I'm not going to go into the full details of a supernova because that's not the point of this video. But all you need to know if you're unfamiliar with a supernova is that basically all the material uh, off the core of the star is going to eject into outer space to form uh, these beautiful nebulas that we see. And the actual core of the star is going to be left over, and it is going to be uh, crushed or compressed by that gravity. And so the, the final stage of a main sequence star is going to be a, a red giant or more of just a red type star. And once it ejects that material and the core compresses, that core is going to compress into one of three objects that we know of. For a very, very small or a less massive core, that's going to be a white dwarf. For a very, very massive core, that is going to be a black hole. And in kind of a Goldilocks zone in the middle is going to be a neutron star, which could be a pulsar, as is depicted in this picture. But when we have that material in the core of that star, that, that, that core is not ejecting any material out. That core, all the material that's in that core is staying there, and it's being compressed. And so the real question that we need to ask ourselves is, where can we remove some space for that core to actually begin to compress and get more tightly packed together? Well, we have to look at the atom here, and really the only place where we can lose some space is between the orbits of our electrons and the nucleus of the atom. This pushes the electrons closer to our protons and the nucleus, which leads to us having the perfect conditions for electron-induced or just inverse beta decay, where we have the proton and electron react to leave us with a neutron and an electron neutrino. So that's kind of a quick and general way of understanding why we have more neutrons than we do uh, protons or electrons. But the important question here is how many more neutrons are there than protons or electrons? And notice how I'm changing my notation here to n naught. You'll see why that's the case in a moment, because warning, the physics is about to start. This is pretty much a warning for everybody because... Uh, if you don't like math and physics and stuff like that, I'm just going to be doing algebra. So don't, don't worry, it's just going to be algebra, but that might scare some people away. That might be a whole separate warning for some of you because I might be oversimplifying it to the point that it aggravates you. Here we go. <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> All right, so let's go through our initial setup and make the uh, following assumptions here. First, we're going to assume a spherical core. We're dealing with a spherical star, so I think it's fair to assume a spherical core. We're going to need that for volumes and things like that. We're also going to assume the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that's going to be really important. That's not uh, exactly how things work in the real world, but that's just one uh, assumption and simplification we're going to do for this. We're also going to assume the same mass between protons, neutrons, and electrons. Again, this is not the case as it is in the real world, but but we're going to make this assumption just to simplify things again. Basically, just assume that all this matter is identical in every single way except for charge. And now we're going to in introduce this variable uh, number density. And number density is basically just defined as the number of particles that we have in a particular volume. Okay, so just the number of particles, or it could really be any anything, but in our case it's going to be particles in a particular volume. So in this case it's going to be just the number of whatever particle we're considering here uh, in the volume of a sphere. And so this gives us that our number density for our protons, neutrons, and electrons from the start are going to all be equivalent because we said that we're dealing with the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons right here uh, in our initial setup from before. And so with this number density, we can go ahead and use our volume of a sphere, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed, and set this situation up for just one particle. We, so for the sake of simplicity, just put one particle in some kind of volume. So we can see this relationship here between radius and number density, where we have this constant stuff out front times n to negative 1 thirds uh, power. And uh, we can just call all this constant junk out front A to give us that 
our uh, radius is equal to a times n to the minus one thirds power. But I don't want you to think about this as a relationship, particularly between radius and number density. We're doing this much more generally, okay? We're doing this much more generally. So I want you to think about this as a relationship between just position, some sort of, uh, you know, like positional unit and our number density. And so we're going to use this relationship in the next part, which is considering uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle tells us that our uncertainty in position and our uncertainty in momentum must be greater than or equal to h bar divided by 2, where h bar is just a constant. It is more particularly the reduced Planck constant, so it's just the Planck constant divided by 2 pi. You can go ahead and Google uh, the Planck constant or the reduced Planck constant if you want an actual number, but we don't need it just because it's constant. And what we need to focus on particularly here is this uncertainty in position. From before, we have this relationship right here between position and number density, and so it's not too much of a stretch to say that our uncertainty in position should be very similar to our relationship between position and number density. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to plug in our relationship that times our uncertainty in momentum must be greater than h bar per Two And uh, with this, we can go ahead and uh, do some basic algebra right here to see uh, that we just get another group of constants right over here. We can call that B, just rope it all into another big constant. And so with uh, that uh, grouping of constants and just calling it B, we end up getting this general rela re relationship here. Again, this isn't perfect by any means and it's probably not the best by any means but this tells us that our momentum or at least our uncertainty in momentum should be at the very least uh, something along the lines of some constant uh, times uh, n to the cube root and uh, remember that with this greater than or equal to um, or uh, maybe it should be uh, approximately or equal to or uh, greater than or, or approximately uh, you know, this, this type of relationship here, but this is a minimum momentum that we kind of want to think about here based off of this relationship with uncertainty principle. By now, this is the part that kind of has me weirded out, I guess, where I'm kind of doing a little, I feel myself doing a little bit of hand waving here, but again, I'm trying to do this to uh, really have people uh, from as wide of an audience as be able to understand kind of how we get this relationship right here. So Let's 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 dive back into this right here. Uh, hopefully, it's not too hand wavy. All right, and hopefully, it's not too hand wavy because it's now time to consider energy. Like any good physicist, we must consider energy. And for this particular system, our total energy is just going to be the rest mass energy plus our Fermi energy. So m c squared plus our Fermi energy. Now, uh, if those that are unfamiliar with Fermi energy, it's just a quantum mechanics concept uh, that will consider uh, all the different states of a uh, group of particles such as the ones that we're looking at, uh, particularly uh, fermions, but I don't want to have a conversation about what is a Fermi energy, so you can go look that up on your own. I'm, this, this is turning out to not be as good of an experiment as I hoped for, but again, I'm doing my best and I'm just trying to have some fun here, so here we go. Okay, and so... Uh, for a non-relativistic case, our Fermi energy it looks very similar to our fair, to our con just standard understanding of kinetic energy, which is just going to be our Fermi momentum squared divided by two times the mass for a non-relativistic case. And for a relativistic case, our Fermi energy is just going to be our Fermi momentum times the speed of light. And this is now where things get interesting because now we're going to suppose infinite density. And so, what exactly is that going to do to our number density? Volume is going to be uh, decreasing quite dramatically, and uh, generally speaking, the number of particles that we're having here is, is pretty much staying, I don't want to say consistent, because we're going through inverse beta uh, decay, but we're not losing any of the actual material. That means our number density is going to start to uh, increase. Well, with our number density increasing... That means that our minimum momentum should also increase, and increase, well, infinitely, since we're assuming infinite density. With our minimum momentum increasing, well, we're looking more and more so uh, in the relativistic case, more specifically the ultra-relativistic case, and so uh, we're going to just consider modeling the energy for such a system with our rest mass energy and uh, our, plus our Fermi momentum times the speed of light. And 
in reality, because we're dealing with infinite density or we're considering infinite density here and our minimum momentum just growing dramatically, this rest mass energy becomes pretty much negligible. Now again, we're doing a little bit of hand waving here. We're making a lot of simplifications to this. But one of the things I kind of want to get out of the way is if we're assuming or supposing infinite density, doesn't this mean we're considering matter more so for a black hole than a neutron star? Well, if you go back uh, quite a ways, um, we're just dealing with protons, neutrons, and electrons. We don't know anything about any of those other particles, and particularly why the neutron star is so incredibly interesting for us to study is that we know it's a very compact, ultra-dense ball of matter that we can actually see in interact with, or I mean, maybe we can't interact with it, but we can see interactions with it that are physically uh, interacting with that matter that makes up the star. You can see like thermonuclear x-ray bursts, for example, where you see matter from an accretion disk fall onto the surface of the neutron star, and then we can see how that matter reacts with something else. Whereas with a black hole, you have the event horizon. And past the event horizon, light cannot escape. You can't see any of the interaction that is taking place with that actual matter because it's past the event horizon. With a neutron star, you don't have that event horizon there. You can still physically see and see the interactions with the actual matter itself and with the actual star itself. Now, that's not to say you can't see different, you can't see different things happening with black holes. You can't see what's actually happening with that matter that makes the black hole. Okay, so now that we've done all this modeling, we move on to having to recall charge balance, meaning that the number of protons we have must be the same as the number of electrons we have. That's because our the, the, the net charge of this system should be neutral. It shouldn't be positively charged. It shouldn't be negatively charged. It should be neutrally charged. This is something very important in physics that we always need to remember. And so that means that our number density for protons should be the same as the number density for electrons. And so if we are to model all of this stuff up, so we have our Fermi energy for our neutrons is equal to our Fermi energy for our protons plus the Fermi energy for our electrons. We end up with a net neutral charge or charge balance here. This isn't a positively charged system or a negatively charged system. And so now the interesting thing that we can do right here, though, is we could plug in all of our uh, Fermi energies for each one of these particles. Hopefully you can see that our speed of light just divides out of this pretty quickly. Okay, and so subbing the Fermi momentum in for each one of these particles, we end up seeing this relationship right here between number densities and the that B constant. The B constant can just be divided out, doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, this is where we need to recall that the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, and so their number densities for protons and electrons are equivalent, as you can see from right here. And so that gives us the cube root of the number density of our neutrons is equal to two times the cube root of the number density of our protons or electrons. We could sub either one of those variables in here. But now we can very easily cube both sides to get this very important relationship right here. This relationship tells us that the number density for our neutrons is equal to eight times the number density of our protons or our electrons. So what we have really is eight times the number of neutrons than protons or electrons. Now I know that there's a ton of hand waving and stuff in there that is not perfect, but this is a really great way for you to see why neutron stars actually get the name neutron star uh, because of the fact that we have eight times as many neutrons as protons or electrons in the material that actually makes up the neutron star. And if you think 90 years ago when they're just thinking protons, neutrons, and electrons, they're not thinking about quarks or any further decays or anything else like that, that's where the name neutron star comes from. Because just thinking about what happens to matter when uh, you start to get that compression of a stellar core, you would end up with a ton more neutrons than protons or electrons. And that's really where the name comes from. Now we could go and take this much, much further. Uh, one of the things we need to consider is that neutrons don't exist outside of uh, the nucleus of an atom, except for once you get past the neutron drip density, which deserves its own conversation in its own right. But I hope that now you can better understand why neutron stars are actually called neutron stars, why scientists some 90 or 100 years ago, probably closer to 90 years ago, maybe 80, somewhere between 80 and like 95 years ago, gave them the name neutron star. 
And hopefully also I want you to see just how much benefit there is in just having a little bit of fun and doing quick, dirty, back of the envelope physics or mathematics because just doing some fun stuff like that can really get your mind turning and get really get your mind thinking that's one of the things that is so much fun to do just quick and off the cuff so that you can kind of start thinking about some of these interesting or more weird scenarios because again 90 years ago we had no idea that these things even existed okay i'm going to leave it at that maybe we'll go and do some more uh rigorous uh, physics or mathematics at some point in the future. I definitely do want to talk about neutron drip density at some point in the future on its own anyways also, but that is why neutron stars are called neutron stars. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you enjoyed something, or hopefully at the very least, I just gave you a good review of why neutron stars are called neutron stars. But that all said, I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you again next time, or maybe we'll talk about some math stuff or physics stuff or neutron star stuff, whatever I happen to want to make a video on. But thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.